In this presentation, we're going to discuss boards of review. So boards of review and not board of reviews? That's right. A scout is, of course, grammatically correct. Now, where does it say that? Oh, it doesn't actually say that, but, Okay, you know. okay. I know. Boards of review is the right way. Can I go on now? You do. You go on and on and on. First, we're going to discuss common elements to every board of review. Then the particulars for Tenderfoot through Life Rank and Eagle Palm boards of review. There are separate presentations addressing Eagle boards of review, appeals to boards of review, and boards of review under disputed circumstances. After a scout's completed the requirements for any rank or Eagle Palm, he appears before a board of review. When my new scouts see the phrase board of review, they seem to get a little nervous. Yeah, mine too, but they usually feel better once they've actually participated in a couple of boards of review. Yeah, I mean, a board of review should be something that the scout looks forward to, where he can give his opinion of what's going on. Well, the purpose of a good board of review is to determine the quality of the scout's experience and to decide whether he's qualified to advance and encourage him to continue on. So what determines if he's qualified to advance or not? We'll get into that, and qualified is an important and sometimes misunderstood phrase. Okay, but I really want to talk about that because I think it's important to understand. Before we do, though, let's cover some of the very basic things about boards of review. Okay. I think one of the most important concepts is timeliness. Because a board of review date becomes the effective advancement date, opportunities for boards of review should be scheduled monthly so scouts aren't delayed in beginning time-oriented requirements for the next round. How does a scout qualify for a board of review? Well, when a scout's completed all the requirements for a rank, he's ready for a board of review. A scout can't be denied this opportunity. When he believes he's completed all the requirements, including a scoutmaster conference, it is up to the unit leader and the committee to assure a board of review is held. So once the book is signed, he asks for a board of review? Well, naturally a scout will ask this, but it's also the direct responsibility of the unit leader and the committee to make sure it happens. Scoutmasters, for example, don't have the authority to expect a boy to request a board review or somehow to defer this request to him or to ask him to perform beyond the requirements in order to be granted one. So we don't want to just leave him hanging there wondering what happens next. Exactly. We want to be supportive and encouraging and make sure the scout understands when and where the next board review opportunity will be. Okay, that makes sense. Now who's on the board of review? Well, a board of review must consist of no fewer than three members and no more than six. Unit leaders and assistants may not serve on a board of review for a scout in their own unit. So an assistant scoutmaster isn't allowed to sit in on a board of review? That's right. Neither can a scoutmaster. Can I be on a board of review for my own son? Well, no. Parents or guardians may not serve on a board for their son. I should note that the candidate or his parents or guardians shall have no part in selecting any board of review members either. When he gets to his board of review, it's preferred that a scout be in a full field uniform. He should wear as much as he owns, and it should be as correct as possible with the badges worn properly. I heard the word preferred there. I always thought that scouts had to be in full uniform for a board of review. You're right. That's what you heard, preferred. A uniform is preferred. How come it's not required? Well, can you imagine a circumstance where a scout wouldn't have a uniform available when a board of review is scheduled? Well, maybe during a baseball season when a scout has to come directly from the game to the meeting so they're wearing a different uniform or if they've outgrown their existing uniform. Yeah, that's right. And it's just one of many, many legitimate reasons. So we're instructed that if wearing all or part of the uniform is impractical for whatever reason, the candidate should be clean and neat in his appearance and dressed appropriately according to his means for the milestone marked by the occasion. But what if my troop requires a uniform? Well, regardless of unit expectations or rules, boards of review may not reject candidates dressed as we've described. Neither may they require the purchase of uniforming or clothing such as coats and ties or anything like that. Remember, the candidate should be clean and neat in his appearance and dressed appropriately according to his means. So we no longer believe in uniforms? Well, of course we do. I mean, it's one of the methods of scouting. What we're saying here is, is that there are many legitimate reasons that a scout may not have a uniform available 
We want to keep boards of review timely, and we don't want to unduly obstruct a scout's participation in one, nor do we want to add to the list of requirements that qualifies them for a board of review. So uniforms are preferred, but in the absence of a uniform, being neat and clean in appearance is acceptable. That's right. Not only acceptable, but specifically mandated by the Guide to Advancement. Now let's talk about the specifics for Tenderfoot, Through Life Ranks, and Eagle Palms. So who's on the Board of Review? Three to six unit committee members make up a Board of Review. And is someone in charge? Who runs the board? One member sitting on the board serves as the chairperson. Okay. And how long should a Board of Review take? A good Board of Review lasts approximately 15 minutes and never longer than 30 minutes. And at the end of the Board of Review, can we hand him his, his patch for his next rank? No, we don't present a rank or an eagle palm until the advancement is recorded and reported to the council. Now that we all know how a scout qualifies for a board review, who sits on a board review, and the policy on uniforms, let's look at what happens at a board review. Okay, so this is where I return to my earlier observation that a lot of my new scouts are pretty nervous about a board review. Most adults would admit to being nervous if told they were to appear before something called a board of review. I mean, imagine how a scout must feel. A certain level of formality and meaningful questioning should exist, but it's important that the atmosphere be relaxed. Formal, but relaxed. That sounds about right. Yes, it may help if the unit leader introduces the candidate and if a few minutes are spent getting acquainted. The unit leader may remain in the room, but only to observe, not to sit on the board and not to participate in the conversation unless somebody needs to ask him a question. Okay. Can a scout's parents observe a board of review? The scout's parents, relatives, or guardians may not be in attendance in any capacity, not as members of the board, as observers, or even as the unit leader. Their presence can really change the discussion dynamics with the scout. But what if they insist? So if they insist on being in the room, they should be counseled about why this is important. Their presence can change how the scout addresses the questions, and the opportunity for further self-reliance and courage may be lessened. However, if parents or guardians insist on being present, they must be permitted to attend. A board is not required to record minutes, but it's not such a bad idea. Any such notes remain confidential to the members of the board or to administrators with a need to know. These may be used in preparing a follow-up letter should the scout be turned down, and they can be helpful in an appeal process. In any case, once a board of review approves a scout or a subsequent appeal is completed, all these notes are considered confidential and they need to be destroyed. Does a scout get tested on his requirements at a board of review? No. No, the Board of Review is not a retest or an examination. Though one reason for a Board of Review is to ensure the scout did what he was supposed to do to meet the requirements, policy says it shall not become a retest or an examination, nor a challenge of his knowledge. You know, I have read a number of Board of Review procedural notes online, and a lot of them talk about retesting scouts. Well, it's a pretty common misconception that a Board of Review is somehow an examination or a test. Let's remember that while there is a lot of helpful information and compelling arguments online, that what we're talking about is not people's advice or opinions, but we're talking about adhering to the clearly expressed policies of the Boy Scouts of America. So if I hear or read something different online, I should check it against the Guide to Advancement? That's right. Okay, so if a board isn't retesting a scout's knowledge, what exactly are they reviewing? Well, in most cases, it should instead be a celebration of accomplishment. Remember, it's more about a journey. A badge recognizes what a young man is able to do and how he has grown, not so much a reward for what he's done. The scout may be asked where he learned his skills and who taught him and what he gained from fulfilling requirements. The answers will reveal what he did, and it can be determined if, then, it was what he was supposed to do to earn the rank that he's being reviewed for. Okay, so we don't just run down the list of requirements and ask about each one? Well, the scout's already completed those requirements, and that's been recorded in his book, right? Yeah, otherwise he wouldn't be at a board of review. So what we're now looking for is to understand how going through that process of achieving requirements has achieved the aims of scouting. So we aren't asking him to tie a square lashing. We're asking him more about what he got out of the experience of learning how to tie a square lashing. Yeah, now you're catching on. Somebody already saw him demonstrate a square lash and indicated that by signing the book. What we want to know now is how that and all the other experiences he's had as a scout 
working towards this rank have helped him grow. That sounds a lot more useful than a skill retest. Well, it's a lot more useful for the scout, his patrol, and his troop. Okay, so I get the tone and the purpose of a board, but what specifically is discussed? Well, the Troop Committee Guidebook has examples of appropriate questions. The scout may be asked where he learned his skills and who taught him, and what he gained from fulfilling requirements. The answers will reveal what he did, and it can be determined if, then, it was what he was supposed to do to earn the rank that he's being reviewed for. The Board of Review will soon have a picture of the strengths and weaknesses of the unit program. Periodic reviews of scouts' progress can provide a measure of unit effectiveness. The unit might uncover ways to increase the educational value of its outings or how to strengthen administration of national advancement procedures, for example. If it's discovered that troop leaders aren't assuring that all the requirements have been met before scouts present themselves to a board review, then process improvements can be recommended. A board can also help by considering the style of leadership that's best suited to the current circumstances and way to adjust it to different needs for different scouts. Note that boards of review also may be held for scouts who aren't advancing. Much can be learned from them as well. Okay, so now I see that a board of review is not just a review of the impact the program has had on the scout, but also of the way the unit presents the program. So at some point, the board has to decide if a scout is qualified or not. I'm still not sure I understand what qualified means. Well, naturally, qualified means that a scout has completed the requirements for the next rank, right? These will include things like scout spirit and active participation, and in the higher ranks, fulfilling a position of responsibility. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the board could check the handbook or other records to see that requirements have been signed off. Okay, but what if the scout doesn't have his handbook with him? Well, the board can still be held even if the scout doesn't have his handbook. Remember that timeliness is an important element to the process. Scouts want to keep advancing, and we need to do all in our power to help them maintain that momentum. We don't want to put roadblocks in their way. Actually, we want to clear the road and avoid any kind of administrative obstacles. Okay, so I suppose the board could check their own records if the scout doesn't have his handbook handy? That's right. They could also hold the review and make their decision contingent on checking the handbook later on. Okay, so then qualified means that the scout has completed the requirements. Is that it? It also means that a scout has had the experiences and growth to move on to the next rank and that a young man accepts scouting's ideals and meets good standards in his life. Okay, so how does the board make this decision? Well, once they've reviewed the scout, they ask him to step outside for a moment. They discuss what they've learned and vote on whether the scout is ready to advance. To approve awarding a rank or an eagle palm, the board must agree unanimously. If the members agree a scout is ready to advance, he's called in and congratulated. The board of review date then becomes the rank's effective date, not the subsequent court of honor when the scout receives a patch. Okay, but what happens if the board doesn't agree unanimously? So if the board doesn't all agree, every effort should be made to deliberate with careful consideration of each member of the board's perspective and in sufficient detail to avoid any kind of factual misunderstandings there may be. It's appropriate to call the candidate back if additional questions may clarify the situation. If the board does disagree, the scout shall not be informed about the specifics of the conversations they've had or any arguments that are taking place amongst board members. So he wouldn't be told what the vote was or who voted for or against his advancement, just that the board did not agree. Yes, that's right. The nature of arguments and discussions is confidential to the members of the board. If a board decides not to approve a scout for advancement, then he needs to be informed of that and told what to do so he can improve. If it's thought that a scout before his 18th birthday can benefit from an opportunity to properly complete the requirements, the board may adjourn and reconvene at a later date. If the candidate agrees with this, then if possible, the same members of the board should reassemble at this later date. If he does not agree, then the board must make its decision at that point. In any case, a follow-up letter must be promptly sent to the scout who is turned down. It should include actions advised that may lead to advancement and also an explanation of applicable appeal procedures. So we have other presentations on many advancement subjects. That's right. The hits just keep on coming.
Okay, so if you have other questions about boards of review, please consult the Guide to Advancement. You can also speak with your district and council advancement coordinators. Right. It's important to start there, but if you're still stumped, you can email the National Advancement Team at advancement.team at scouting.org. So I'm Lisa. I thought I was going to be first this time. Oh, all right. Well, go ahead. Be first. We already said it. Well, go ahead. We'll fix it in the editing later. Okay. I'm Clark. And I'm Lisa. Until next time. You know, every once in a while, it's not bad if I'm first. <laughs> Until next time. Until next time. Thanks, folks.